Hello, welcome. Good to see you all. Hello online, our friends at home. Good to see you. <laughs> um, so welcome. Tonight is a kind of a new class, kind of an evolution of a class series. Um, so just to introduce myself, for those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Tig O'Malley. A meditation teacher. Uh, I have been practicing since I was in sixth grade. Uh, meditation was part of the curriculum in the schools that I went to. Uh, and then I started deepening my practice of the Dharma uh, in my 20s. So uh, I've been practicing Buddhism for about 20 years, um, practicing for almost 30. Um, I did my formal training to teach at University of Massachusetts Medical School and at Penn Medical Center. Uh, I'm certified to teach a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. I also teach Cultivating Emotional Balance, uh, which is another meditation-based program that um, is a deeper dive into our experience with emotions. Um, so I'm currently teaching uh, for a research study at Brown University called Mindfulness-Based Queer Resilience. I teach contemplative art classes at Pratt Institute, and I'm developing uh, mindfulness programming at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background as a teacher. Um, we're here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, so this is... Um, this. The SFDC is, I like to think of it as an umbrella for lots of different um, ways into teaching. So we don't have one particular lineage here. Um, so it's kind of an umbrella that all different lineages can, can sit under and particularly secular ones. So a lot of my training is in secular, more universal um, methodology. It is based in Buddha Dharma. Um, but taught without any of the sutras or um, any of the kind of religious undertones that some of the Buddhist teachings may have. Um, so here at the Dharma Collective, it's community run. Tonight we're going to be talking about ethics. And so I think that the Dharma Collective is a great example of embodied ethics in the way that it's run, that the teachings are, it's a gifting economy. So it's all Donna based. Um, it's free for everyone to be here. And then any uh, contribution that you would like to make for the teachings or to keep the center open are greatly appreciated, but not required. Um, so as this series of classes unfolds, I'll talk a little bit more about capitalism and economy. And um, But for now, it's great to know that we are sitting in a physical space and a digital space that kind of represents an alternative to some of the destructive natures of our economy. So this series called Embodied Ethics, it's based on secular ethics. Um, it's been a evolution of a class that I've been teaching here for the past couple of months that's been exploring kind of the overlap of secular mindfulness with Buddha Dharma, kind of how they both inform each other and support each other. Uh, and so this offering is going to be a four or five part series uh, every Tuesday in April, um, where we kind of continue that momentum. For those of you that may have been at um, the last session, uh, we started kind of inching closer to ethics and how mindfulness is an ethic and how when we practice the felt experience in the body, when we practice deep listening, when we practice being with our thoughts, that these are all supportive to ethical ways of being in the world. We'll come back to mindfulness as an ethic later in the series. Um, but for me, I really, um, <clears throat> I feel that there are some fundamental problems in our society, um, our form of economy, our politics, oppression, uh, in the queer resilience course that I teach, we talk a lot about minority stress and so how people that fall into minor minority categories in our culture, whether it's gender, sexual orientation, race, um, ability, are oppressed. And um, there's a, a lack of ethics in how we are treating these populations. Um, as I went through kind of my spiritual awakening, I woke up and I was a creative director in uh, corporate marketing. And I was like, wow, whoa, this is highly problematic what we're doing here. You know, the psychological manipulation in order to sell product, 
um, the the uh, kind of commodification and objectification of the human body in order to sell product. Um, again, kind of these systems of oppression within capitalism. Um, and I just felt this really deep dissatisfaction with the way that things are being run. And it's not just about America, but it is seems to be kind of a modern cultural um, phenomenon that we're experiencing. I've traveled around the world. I've been to 65 different countries, uh, and I don't really see anywhere else that's that much better. There, there might be a continuum, uh, but we have some problems, and we really need to start looking at them. And so I really wanted to um, create an offering that would help um, not just uh, learn about them, but also practice and embody these ethical ways of being. Um, I believe that uh, religion was originally intended to be a source of morality and ethics. And then over time, I think we can all agree in various ways, they've become corrupted and disillusioned from the original teachings. Um, and so I think my, my personal view is that religion was where humanity was getting some of these guidelines from. And then as the institutions kind of took hold of them, it may have uh, clouded some of that. Um, and so I like to think of kind of like, where, where is the user's manual? Where's the user's guide for being human? And in my experience, I found it inside. It's in here. And I can access it when I meditate. I can access it when I try to embody the learnings that I have, the insights that I am able to touch into when I'm practicing and then take that out into the world. Um, and so the intention for this kind of deeper dive into secular ethics is how can we do this? How can we learn, practice, and embody these ethical ways of being in the world in a way that's separate from religion, in a way that is not so tied to a lot of those uh, institutions? Uh, so really what my hope is for all of us to kind of learn and feel more about these ethics. And I like to, I know it's super cliche, but I do firmly believe that change starts with the individual. Uh, I don't know, you know, if capitalism will fail, I, I think that that might be fairly destructive, right? And so in the meantime, we all have to, welcome. We all have to start doing our work to figure out a better way, a better alternative. Uh, no one's coming to save us. It's just us. So um, I've been really inspired by um, a lot of these kind of secular viewpoints on different ethical values and principles um, that I have been experimenting with. And, and that's an invitation that I'd like to offer for all of you is to think about this as experimentation not judgment that I'm I'm doing this right or wrong or that person is right or wrong, but that we can try things out. Um, I have been experimenting with gifting economy in my own life. I've been experimenting with different ways of being in the world. Some have worked really well and others have not. And so I think that we're in a time period right now where we can all just try in our own ways, um, different alternatives from the norm that is, has become so destructive. Um, so that's just a, a little overview of the series. Um, we're going to just arrive, have a little quick uh, arrival practice to settle in, maybe just five or six minutes to uh, close our eyes if that feels comfortable and just welcome ourselves into this moment, this space, this time together. So just finding a way of being that feels comfortable for the next five or six minutes. <clears throat> and an invitation here as we start to slow down a bit and welcome stillness into the body is just to notice what's here for you. What energy are you carrying into our session tonight? Perhaps that's a mood or emotion. Maybe it's lingering energy from activities of the day.
maybe it's an energy or sensations in the body that you're noticing. And there's no right or wrong. There's no way that you should or should not be feeling right now. It's just taking this precious gift of practice to notice, bring our awareness to our inner world and be with what's here. And an invitation here now to let your awareness drop down to wherever you're feeling, the chair or the floor or cushion, making contact with the body. And just exploring that sensation of contact. Letting the awareness drop out of the thinking mind and down into the felt experience of this point of contact. Even if the mind is moving quickly right now, it might be thoughts or strong emotions, you can find some stability and steadiness just by feeling the support beneath us. And seeing this sensation of contact as an extension of the earth rising up to meet you, to hold you, support you as practice. And while we're here noticing this experience of making contact with the ground, also what's it like to be in community? Some of us are together in the same space, others online, but we're all resting on the same ground. So not only feeling that sensation of contact, but also the support of community. And while we're here with our awareness on the ground beneath us, whether you're in the space or at home, just acknowledging the indigenous folks that were stewards of the land that you're sitting on right now. Acknowledging their sacrifices, their care for this earth before. and honoring and respecting those that came before us. Here in San Francisco, the land of the Olani people. Now with the awareness of this ground beneath us, let's take a moment to come to an awareness of our posture perhaps inviting a lengthening from the tailbone all the way up to the crown of the head. Coming into this gentle lifting or space opening between the vertebra as a way of inviting a sense of vividness into the attention to be present, to be here, these teachings and practices tonight. And then balancing that with a sense of ease. And so welcoming a wave of relaxation through the body, softening the muscles of the face, relaxing the jaw, letting the shoulders be soft, checking for any squeezing or bracing in the abdomen or pelvic floor. Just noticing any areas of obvious tension that might release as you bring your awareness. 
and other areas of the body that there might still be lingering tension, perhaps just allowing it to be there. So here we are grounded with a vivid and alert attention in the sense of ease and relaxation in the body, perhaps in the mind. And you can stay with any of these aspects or join me for a few deep breaths, breathing into that sense of a vivid awareness as the air flows into the body and a sense of ease and relaxation as you let go and the exhale. Breathing in a sharp, crisp attention, focusing on the sensation of breath. Breathing out, letting go, relaxing. and noticing what arises with that sudden sound and allow that to be part of the present moment perhaps focusing more on the out breath to relax the nervous system if it was jolted by that sound And wherever your attention is not gathering up the attention and just taking a moment to consider what it is that brought you here tonight. Perhaps thinking back to when you heard about the embodied ethics course. And what is it that brought you here tonight? And perhaps this will lead to setting an intention for your time tonight, an attitude or energy that you'd like to embody. If it feels comfortable for you together, we can take one more breath following the air into the body. And as we exhale, letting go of this opening practice, taking time to return back to open eyes, inviting movement into the body, if that would feel good to make some stretches or wiggling fingers and toes. <clears throat> Never a dull moment. <laughs> I heard it coming from over there. So um, let's just take a moment and say hi. You know, So for those of you that feel up for it, you just share a name, maybe what your intention is or what it is that brought you here tonight. Um, so we'll just go around the room. Is it, do we have that? Do we have that microphone? Thank you. That one's wireless. Thank you, Noam. So just name and either your intention or what it is that brought you here. Uh, hi, my name is Tom. Is it working? Yeah? Okay. Um, my intention uh, when I read the course is that I realized that I'm spending a lot of my time time being angry at politics mm -hmm. and just feeling like um you know that i know better than all of these people who are just assholes or whatever and i'm just sort of feeling like i'm sort of stuck in that place because it's not i'm not doing anything with that other than being angry and mm -hmm. and um it doesn't feel like it's doing anything other than being sort of self-righteous mm -hmm. so i'm trying to figure out a way to get out of that or Rounded or something. You're in good company. 
Thanks for sharing. Hello. Uh, my name is Emil, and um, I my intention for coming here, or my reason for coming here, was just like uh, wanted to come back to this space. I, I used to come here before the pandemic, and then um, just haven't been here since y'all have like, been to this new space. And uh, it's cool to be back. Welcome back. Yeah. And secular ethics. Sounds pretty cool. Hi, uh, I'm Brian. Uh, my intention tonight is to be present. Thanks, Brian. My name is Matthew, and mainly I'm here because I'm drawn to you as a teacher. I'm also really interested in the ethics. Hello, my name is Daniel, and I'm here I have a very strong sense of who I am and what I'm aligned with. And at the same time, I find that in certain situations, I feel like all of those other values that I think you referenced earlier, um, that like I'm the one that's kind of the problem. And so I want to learn the, some of the language about like what actually to, to name what is it that's happening so that I can understand more about where I am in relation to that. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Grace. Uh, I'm also really drawn to you as um, a teacher and um, I'm also going through some kind of existential crisis, um, looking for more purpose in my life and reevaluating whether there are things I can do to change my current life situation and career, or if I need something like a deeper pivot to find more meaning um, and to be a like better service to society. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ian. Um, what brought me here today is I try and live by a certain, my own code of ethics but also find that sometimes I will struggle with what I think is correct and what I actually do. Um, so interested in, you know, discussing ethics and, and meeting people who are also interested in ethics generally and, and just having a discussion about such topics. Hi, um, I'm Noam and um, I, uh, am drawn to things that have embodied in the title. <laughs> and, uh, I, it's, that doesn't have any nuanced meaning. I just mean, I feel like everything is embodied and we, and part of my practice in the path is to remember that because I lived so much of my life from here up, at least in parts of it. Um, so that is one thing. And then I'm also really interested in secular ethics. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've always felt that, I mean, sort of from a young age when I started having opinions about uh, the veracity of religion, you know, part of it was about the idea that one needed a God in order to be ethical. It right. just always struck me as like, why? I mean, there's plenty of reasons to be ethical mm. that don't require religion mm. or God. So I'm yeah. not trusting that. Thanks, Noah. Okay, folks online. Who would like to go first? Hey, I can go first. Hi, I'm Ash. Uh, just appreciate you, Tig, for uh, hosting us and uh, leading us and, and inviting us. Um, I I studied ethics pretty intensely for a number of years, um, and I think at the time I was very materialistic about it. In a sense, uh, this is very intellectually stimulating kind of 
capturing an analytical form of that. And I think I really am interested in, um, as I've gotten older, uh, interested in the more of the practice of it and implementation of it and the implications of how to live a good life and, and help society in the best way. And this is doing this through this um, framework seems like a much more less materialistic, less intellectualism for intellectual intellectualism's sake kind of approach. And it seems very, very appropriate. So my intention for tonight is to is to engage with this in a, in a more embodied sense. Thanks, Ash. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anu, and uh, I uh, basically uh, I'm here because I really enjoyed your teaching and a couple of other, uh, you know, uh, sessions that I I I've heard you speak, and uh, I'm more curious about the topic of embodied ethics, and you know, just to listen in and see what uh, what kind of conversations. Uh, or, 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 or interesting ideas are going to come up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Diane, and I'm here because to to practice the Dharma. I take refuge in the Dharma. I'm a bit isolated, and it's just such a blessing to be able to go to these teachings. And I've benefited so much from the prior classes. I'm here to end suffering for myself and everybody. At least do no harm. And um, ethics is part of the path. I want to behave in an ethical way. And um, just thank you for asking, and thanks for, for these wonderful teachings. Thank you. Diane. And my name is Tia, and I am um, <clears throat> uh, super interested in the ways that the Dharma can be in daily life. And I think that uh, all of our ethical choices, my ethical choices are, are um, <clears throat> you know, informed by everything that's happened to me so far. And I'm super interested in being as conscious and at choice about what I'm doing as I can be. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Tia. Great, that was rich. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I want you all to try to remember what it was that you just shared, because we're gonna have the, the last half hour is just gonna be open conversation. So if there are things that you specifically named that you're interested in talking about or exploring deeper, we can come back to that. Um, so I'll have a couple prompts if we need them, but also um, just trying to you know put a little pin in what it was that, um, you intend to explore a little bit, knowing that we have that last 30 minutes for kind of open dialogue. <clears throat> and I think, you know, one other thing that I wanted to mention after I, I felt, uh, I was feeling excitement, actually, as people were sharing, you know, um, about like, about the ethics and this kind of point of view that there, there, this openness that I was feeling from all of you to explore um, kind of what this means and how to come, how to bring it to life in your own ways. Um, the other thing that came forward is that there are a lot of shares about the embodiment aspect and the intellectual aspect. And so those of you that have sat with me know that I'm very body-based, like how is this feeling in the somatic field, what's coming up, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, especially if it's unpleasant. Um, and so really an invitation for our entire time together to just stay with your experience in the body. How is this feeling? If I say something that that really energizes you, notice where that shows up in the body. If I say something that might rub a little bit on something, notice where that comes up. Um, and if it's more neutral, just what's that like? Um, but there's lots of teachings and writings on ethics. You know, you can Google it, you can chat GPT it. We have a whole library here that, that talks about ethics. Um, and my intention really is to dip a little toe in the intellectual aspect, a tiny little toe, <laughs> and more into the actual felt experience. And that's why, you know, for me, what's been so exciting about exploring ethics is how we cultivate them through meditation, because we can 
think, I, I don't think that we can think our way out of the issues that we're in. I think we have to feel them. For those of you that were with us last time, we were talking a lot about how um, interoception, the what we practice when we're doing a body scan, feeling the body from the inside is key to navigating ethics because we have to feel. What is it like when we are faced, when we're watching news or see something on the street or for those of us in San Francisco, like, it, it's hard to walk down the street here and be like, what is going on? And if we cut ourselves off from the feelings in the body, we're just bypassing. And I am of the school of thought that it's impossible to bypass. It will come up somewhere. We might think that we are pushing it down or ignoring it, but it will come up. So with that, an invitation just to stay with the felt experience of the body. Um, so a couple quick agreements just to kind of set the container. Um, so I know it's super cliche, but be present, be here. Uh, notice what the experience is like in your body, in your mind, in your heart. For those of you online, you get a master class in presence because you're on technology. So really setting that intention to be here fully as much as that feels uh, available to you. And the, the second one is practice. You know, this is all about practice. We're practicing right now, right now, listening, feeling, um, being with the curiosity of what this is going to be like. That's already practice. Um, we are going to have some formal periods of meditation, but really seeing um, our time together as an experiential practice, whether we have our eyes closed and we're meditating or we're listening or when we're talking, that we can be um, we can be in our practice. Um, participation. So we're really co-creating this space. I already feel that happening after you all shared. Um, and so I'm not a huge fan of like the hierarchy of like teacher student. So even though I'm holding the space, um, invite you to participate to a degree that feels comfortable for you, especially when we get to that sharing. Um, and then taking care of yourself. So there's a concept called windows of tolerance. And that we can, we grow and we learn when we're in a safe, grounded place, when our nervous system is calm and non reactive. Uh, and when that uh, window of tolerance moves up into hyper arousal or down into hypo arousal, like disassociation, uh, welcome, Walt. Good to see you. Um, that we, it, it's difficult to learn and practice when we're not in that kind of middle area. Um, so notice what's happening for you and your experience and take care of yourself as you need. So if you need to take a break, you know, if you're in the space, you're welcome to go in the back. There's a restroom and tea at any time. Feel free to go back there. Um, if you're online and you need to turn your camera off, please feel free. Um, so just really taking care of yourself, listening, um, taking breaks when you need, and then also taking care of each other. You know, it's class on ethics, so we have to be cognizant of how we're impacting each other. Um, and mainly that comes in the form of really deep listening. So when someone else is sharing that we are fully with what they're saying, um, of course, we're always going to have the little, you know, uh, when someone is sharing and we're listening, there'll be some analysis or trying to really understand what they're saying and, and be with their words and their felt experience. Um, and really, I would ask that we avoid giving any advice, um, speaking from the I perspective, especially if you are um, responding to what someone else shared, just keep it to what your experience is. And um, finally, kind of respect, you know, respecting each other, that we have different viewpoints, um, that we're all trying to figure this out. And some of us, maybe doing it in different ways. So I like to think that our strength as a species, as consciousness comes in our diversity. And so even if people say something that you disagree with, we can still respect their point of view. It's coming from somewhere. We're gonna be talking about interconnection and interbeing tonight. And so understanding that what a person, myself or any of anyone else in the space or online is sharing is coming from their own lived experience. Um, so really respecting that. Um, I do want to just make a little disclaimer because ethics can be kind of like a big thing. You know, I'm not an expert in ethics. I'm an expert in how I'm orienting myself to them. And I have studied and take, taught, uh, taken teachings on ethics. Um, but really, I want to provide this container for uh, listening, practice, and sharing. 
Um, also, I carry inherent biases that are unconscious um, that I might not be aware of. We all have blind spots. And so I am in uh, a male body. I have white skin. And these also influence my biases and my lived experience of privilege. And so I want to just name that. Um, and if anything that I say rubs or it doesn't feel true to what your experience is, please share if that feels comfortable and we can grow and learn together. And if it doesn't feel comfortable to share, please feel free to drop me a line uh, or even email the Dharma Collective and, and we can and we can talk about it through those channels. Um, the last part is uh, I want to be really clear that I am fairly judgmental about the systems that we're living in. I do think that they're bad and wrong. <laughs> However, I don't think any of us that are participating in them are. So you might hear some fairly strong charge. Uh, you might feel that energy from me. I'm not judging anyone. It's the systems that I have fought with, not anyone that's participating in them. I get we are all just trying to survive and figure out how to make it through this world. Um, so I just want to put that out there because um, I know sometimes when we're talking about capitalism or marketing and that we might have people in the group that are actively in jobs like that. And, uh, and I understand, you know, I myself had a 20 year career in corporate marketing. So I definitely understand and I don't judge the individual. Okay. Anything else that would help uh, people feel more welcome or safe in, in this space or in our time together? Okay, if there's anything that you need that we can support you with, please let us know. So let's jump in. What are ethics? <laughs> um, so we're gonna be exploring that over the next month or so, but really the, 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 the definition that we'll be working with are kind of moral principles, um, kind of how we govern our own behavior and conduct ourselves. There is, I think it is important to kind of delineate the difference between a, a moral and an ethic. A moral is more of like a guiding principle and the ethic is kind of how we live it, how we act and behave according to those principles. Um, so that's kind of the short version of the ethics. And then what makes it secular? So that we're not tied to a particular religion or supernatural power. The, the secular ethics don't require a particular worldview. We are in a Dharma center, which some can consider to be a religion, um, but the uh, secular ethics do not require any belief in reincarnation or any of the kind of fundamental Buddhist principles that many of us practice, it's universal which I actually believe is how the Buddha taught in the first place. Uh, the Buddha wasn't really a Buddhist, right? So he was just teaching in a way that was accessible for people to understand in, in Northern India at the time. Um, and then over the course of history, it has kind of shaped into different forms and some veer more towards religion and others are more secular. As you heard when I introduced myself, I teach in hospitals and universities. So all of my teaching has to be secular because I teach in public institutions. So you don't need to um, get hung up on a particular religious principle, particularly with Buddhism. Um, and with that, all religion, all worldviews are welcome here. You know, there's a lot of overlap in these morals, these principles, these ethics between a lot of different religious systems. So. Um, the secular nature of this is kind of free from dogma or doctrine. I'm not going to be talking about sutras or any um, direct teachings from the Buddha. I will be talking a lot about the Dalai Lama um, because he does teach secular ethics. He does teach them in a way that is independent of any kind of religious worldview. Um, I may refer to him as his holiness. For me, that's a sign of respect, not religion. Um, so I just want to be, be mindful of some of these words that might trigger a feel of religion, even though this is a secular format. Um, and one other thing that kind of feeds into the secular idea is that we have scientific research. Um, I'm gonna be reading from some of my notes tonight. I have a little bit of a headache, so I'm gonna just use this kind of help me through. Um, I have this, this point here around science. If we have a correlation between the benefits of cultivating positive values 
such as compassion, caring, peace of mind, um, awareness of others' feelings and emotions with positive health. So I'll read that again. Correlation between the benefits of cultivating positive value with positive health. We have science that demonstrates that. And we also have science that demonstrates the negative values, self-centeredness, anger, resentment, bitterness, um, hate, discrimination, bias with negative health. So we know that these kind of positive values equal constructive health and negative values destructive health. So it actually is in our individual and collective benefit to um, practice these secular ethics. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the, the, the words from His Holiness the Dalai Lama on secular ethics. Um, anyone that is familiar with his book, Beyond Religion is very influential on me and my teaching. So I'll be quoting from that book a lot during the series. Um, so he says that compassion and affection are human values independent of religion. We need these human values. We call these secular ethics, secular beliefs. There's no relationship with any particular religion, even without religion, even as non-believers, we have the capacity to promote these things. And some of you may have heard that he often will use this analogy of tea and water when talking about secular ethics. Um, so tea needs water, but water does not need tea. We cannot survive without water, which is the basic human values, but we can survive without tea, religion. Um, tea does have add additional leaves, spices, or herbs that are flavorful and, and even add nutrition that is lacking in water like the unique contributions of religious ethics, but the necessary ingredient of tea is water. Humanity cannot survive without these basic human values. So I really like this idea of kind of looking at um, the, the tea and the water analogy to help kind of um, reinforce this idea of what ethics are and then how, how they can be secularized. So some of the um, ethics that we're going to be covering over the next five weeks, um, I'm just going to list them off. Kindness, compassion, cooperation, responsibility, honesty and trust, respect, acceptance, fairness, altruism, do no harm, embodied awareness, otherwise known as mindfulness. Um, so what do you all think when, when you hear that about secular ethics, about the Dalai Lama's point of view on the tea and water, what comes up for you? When you're talking about, um, well, actually, let me clarify something. When you're talking about the tea and the water, the, the water is like our basic goodness, sort of. Okay. But one of the positive things about my upbringing is that my mother is an artist and she is like, you know, if one end of the extreme is conceptual and the other one is intuitive, she's like on the high end of the intuitive side of, of that. And so I was raised very much with a message that inside of you, that there is a truth there already. Yeah. Which is, which is really helpful. Yeah. Can I ask, how do you access it? The, the more safe I feel in general and the choices that I make that enable that, that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then just choices that I can make, for example, being in nature, being around people who I feel aligned with. Um. And then sometimes it's, yeah, it's like just conscious choices in terms of, well, it's kind of like, you know, Noam was talking about like being a peer a lot in, in, my, in, in, in my head. And so for me too, and this is something that I struggle with too, because I relate to that. And 
So sometimes it's like, um, for me, the practice is how can I make choices that can help me get more into my body, mm -hmm. whether it's through art or through swimming. I heard you say nature. Yeah, nature. Yeah, and feeling safe. That's the first thing you said. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that's something that we're going to be really exploring, you know, as I mentioned already, this is really about being in the body, noticing how things are feeling already, you know, we're almost 50 minutes into class, like, how is it feeling in the body? Um, and I really appreciate what you're saying about the safety, and that goes back to the windows of tolerance, that we can access these things that are already innate in us when our nervous system is calm. And so that's why a lot of these, the meditations, uh, mindfulness, the kind of relaxation, calming the nervous system are so important. I personally believe I am very aligned with that. that it's already here. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, we were talking about this the other night, like teachers are really pointing to something. And so I'm not asking you to look at my finger. I'm asking you to look at what I'm pointing to. <laughs> look within. So we have these kind of two pillars um, of secular ethics that we're going to spend tonight, the rest of our time together, focusing on one of them, and next week will be the other one. And the two pillars are our shared humanity. You may have heard that said as common humanity. And this, I, I actually will expand that to kind of like our common aliveness, because all living beings share these threads of wanting to be, wanting to feel good and not wanting to feel bad. And so that's one of the pillars of, of, our, of our exploration and ethics. And then the other is our interdependence, our interconnection, um, that nothing happens in isolation. And this is in regards to both ourselves and the natural world. Because a lot of the ethics that we're going to be exploring are interpersonal, relational, but also how we orient ourselves with this planet. Um, so the uh, connection between our own well-being, that of others, and the planet are covered by this kind of common humanity and then interdependence. So we're going to do a little practice on interdependence. Some of you may have been familiar with this uh, concept from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, Augusta actually taught a little bit last night on uh, interbeing. And so it's this idea that if you think of a flower, uh, inside that flower is the energy of the sun, of the energy of, and the nutrients of the soil, of the water. Also in that flower is the energy of the um, of those that cared for it, if it was kind of in a uh, nursery. Um, and so all of that energy is part of the flower. And if you were to take the sun's energy out of the flower or the farmer's energy out of the, the gardener, sorry, the gardener's energy out of the flower, there wouldn't be a flower. And so it's this idea that we are not just connected. I don't believe in separation. I do believe in the delusion that we're separate. Um, but a lot of times the idea of we're all connected requires separation. And so I don't see interconnection as you're over there and I'm over here and there's this thread that's connecting to us. It's that we are the same thing. We're having very different experiences. We are living very different lives. We have very different conditions and causes. Um, but at the root, we all have the same thing running through us. And that's what connects us rather than this kind of you're over there and I'm over here and there's this thread connecting. So we're going to do a little practice. This is the pillar of um, one, this, this, the first pillar that we're going to explore, uh, kind of exploring what that interbeing uh, might feel like for you. So as we start to transition into a period of formal practice, just find a posture that's comfortable. If you're in the space, there's some cushions and blankets. If you'd like to transition down to the floor or even lay down. Um, finding a way of being comfortable yet alert for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And just taking some time to invite the body into stillness whenever you're ready, knowing that at any time in this practice, if you need to move or 
scratch an itch or sneeze, it's always welcome. And so seeing this transition into stillness as an invitation. Perhaps you'd like to close the eyes or lower the gaze down to a surface in front of you. Perhaps for just a moment, coming to an awareness of the breath or perhaps sensations in the body. If being in the body right now is not available to you, you can just listen to sounds in the environment that you're in. Just take a moment to ground yourself in the sensory experience, whether it's breath or a sensation or a sound. Just let the mind start to settle around, settle around that experience. Oftentimes when we start to pour our attention like this into one particular aspect, we notice how busy the mind is. And so carrying that idea of a relaxed state of mind as we pay attention, not forcing or striving. Whatever's happening in the mind and thoughts and other things happening in your environment, they can all be there. And you're just centering on that sensory experience you've chosen. So here we are paying attention to our experience, the foundation of our exploration on ethics, what it's like right now, being with what it is that you're noticing. Whenever the mind moves away from the object that you've chosen to pay attention to, that's just part of the present moment. It's not a problem. Notice when that happens and with that same sense of ease and relaxation, we can let go and return back to the breath or the sensations of the body or sound. For this practice of exploring interbeing, we're going to come into the domain of the mind. So gathering up all of your attention, releasing the object that you've been noticing. I'd like to invite you to call to mind the last meal that you ate. And starting to focus on one particular ingredient in that meal. And let's start to follow the journey that that ingredient took to get to your plate. So thinking back to the person that prepared the food for you, perhaps it was yourself, the energy that was put into making that ingredient ready for the meal. Thinking back to that ingredients journey from a market, maybe a truck driver, an airplane, a train. Perhaps considering the marketplace that that ingredient was at, that it was bought from. 
and the energy of the workers there, that stock, that ingredient. And then following that back another step, considering that ingredient in its natural environment before it was harvested. And considering the energy of the sun, the soil, the water that went into the growth and nurturing of that ingredient. And these may be coming to you as images or perhaps cognitive memory or thoughts, whatever works for you. And considering the energy of the caretakers of that ingredient in its natural state, or the farmers or gardeners, and the energy that they put into raising, nurturing, taking care of this ingredient. Also considering the energy of where those people learned how to take care of this ingredient. And so calling to mind all of the energy that has gone into bringing that ingredient into that last meal that you had, the energy of the farmers, the gardeners, the energy of the sun, the soil, the water, the energy of those that transported the ingredient, that worked in the stores or the market, those that prepared it all the way up to the point that that ingredient was part of your meal. And now considering that that ingredient is inside your body being broken down, it's energy being released into your body to nurture and support you, to repair, to replenish the body. So all of that energy of the environment, the people, that energy is inside of you right now. And then considering how you've been spending that energy since you ate the meal, what you've been doing in the time since you ate and now, and the energy that you've been putting into the world, conversations that you've had, places that you've been, other interactions with people. Even the energy of consuming news or other media, your thoughts, the feelings in the body, they're all a continuation of this chain of energy flowing from that ingredient and all of the sources that nurtured it into your body and then out into the world. So how did you use that energy? Was it to benefit others? Was it to benefit self? And just taking a final moment in practice to consider how you would like to continue utilizing that energy flowing through your body right now. And this is the interconnection, the interbeing of this flow of energy. And we can use that energy to benefit not just ourselves, but others around us, the planet. We can use that energy in constructive and benevolent ways. 
perhaps there's an intention that you'd like to set of how you would like to use that energy moving forward from this point. Before we come to an end of this practice, let's take a moment to let go of any visualization or thought forms and just become aware of what's here right now. What's the felt experience of this present moment for you after that practice? Together as a group, let's follow the next breath deeply into the lungs as it saturates and replenishes us. And then on the out breath, letting go of that air, letting go of that practice, taking time to transition back to open eyes if they were closed and welcoming any movement that would help feel supportive to make that transition. So thank you all for that practice. So this is interdependence. What was that like for you? What did you notice in that practice, whether it was a thought or a feeling? What was that like for you? I had one. <clears throat> I, um, I realized that I am uh, often uh, considering the like growing part of whatever I'm eating um, and the sunshine and the soil and the like actual like uh, pieces of the earth that participated in that, like that feels super comfortable. And I uh, kind of hop it directly over to either the last store or in my house, right? So the 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 getting from the farm to my store, like I know it happens, but I'm not considering it as part of it. So that was really different for me. And then there's people involved with that and really realizing that like, I am super solid about how I feel about the sunshine in my food. And I'm like way more, uh, unclear about how I feel about people that I don't know anything about. Like, how am I connected to that? How does that feel? So that was really interesting and lots of curiosity. Mm. Thanks, Tia. And you, you were describing kind of like the journey to the meal. How about after? Um, that that was easier because it was kind of right before this. So, you know, for like the, the <laughs> I'm okay with my work and now I'm I'm uh, participating in this. So that all feels also really clear. Um and and this container has, even though there's people that I don't already know, along with people that I do already know in this container, like having a container has a, a level of uh clarity about the expectations and relationships in a way that like any of the people who drove the truck to get the thing from the farm to any of the, the pit stops along the way like what do I know about them what do I assume about them why am I assuming anything why yeah that was that was a trip yeah thank you for sharing Yeah, for me, uh, similar, I think, in some ways to what Tia shared, um, just a, a deep sense of gratitude for all the steps and all the people um, and just the, even like the systems in place, even though they might be capitalistic, they brought me my avocado that went into my salad. So yeah, deep sense of appreciation and empathy as well. Um, even though if I met those people, we may disagree on many things. Without them, I wouldn't have had that avocado. Um, and then, yeah, thinking about how I was using the energy um, 
it instilled a bit of desire in me to be more intentional about how I use that energy. Thank you. I love that you kind of naturally went to that place of gratitude and appreciation for it. And we'll talk a little bit about how gratitude is a really important antidote to the lack mindset that capitalism is driving. That's another class. Um, and the intentionality of what we do with that energy. You know, the energy of that avocado is now in us because we just heard your words, right? So then it's like, and I think that also goes back to what Tia was sharing too, of like, we don't really know the journey, all the people that were touching the, that food along the way, um, but we do know what we're doing with it. And that's where I feel like we really have this, I sometimes visualize this as like a chain and we're a link. And so orienting ourselves as not just the receiver of everything that came, and it's great to feel gratitude and appreciation, but then also what's the link that's that's hooked on to us that's going to come next? That's not just about the past, but also how that energy influences, you know, the the thoughts that are happening in everyone's mind in the room right now after hearing your both of your shares. That's an ex a continuation of that energy, you know. So how do we want to use it? Appreciate the intentionality around that. Thank you. Uh, I found I couldn't do it. Um, I chose an egg, and um, I just ran into so much awareness of pain and suffering. I'm not just talking about the chickens. Um, just like along the way, there's just so much. Um, low wage, no wage work. Um, so I was just like, fuck, I'm not doing this. So I just was sort of like thinking about other stuff, but I, so, you know, then processing that, like, what, what's that about? Why can't I do it? Um, makes me wonder you know, there's just so much of that, you know, you were talking about the experience of walking down the street in San Francisco. Um, we just live with constant barrage, if you're paying attention. Um, and so what's the antidote? You know, how do you go there with the chicken and feel gratitude and, you know, use it? And I don't know. That's that's what I was thinking about. Can I ask a, a question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, it's, actually, first, a reflection. To me, it sounds like you did do it. It just sounded really uncomfortable. Like you considered where it was coming from, and it just brought, it stirred up some unpleasantness, and at that point, you decided to shift to something else. Yeah. But you touched something for that a, was... For a, a millisecond. Yeah. And that millisecond yeah. is enough. You know, like a lot of, a lot of these explorations are very uncomfortable yeah. you know uh when we look at not just the energy that we're taking in but also then like what did i do with my energy since i ate you know and like that might not be a pleasant experience but i love that you you talked about the attention like you have to really pay attention and in a way paying attention is an ethic mm -hmm. right it's so easy for us to just kind of like push it aside and assume that everything was good with where it came from but what do you think that um, what do you think that would be constructive for you after that reflection to do with that feeling? Yeah, I don't know. That was part of my reticence to go further. Was just like I don't even want to have to consider what the ethical response to that would be. Mm. Um, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know are some of the wisest words, <laughs> you know, so it's okay to not know. I don't know how to fix capitalism, right? I, I, that's not, but I know that there's something that makes me feel uncomfortable about it. And so I can explore alternatives. And so maybe things that, you know, I don't know if, if this was uncomfortable for other people, but if, so there's some not, heads nodding that we can take some time to reflect on alternatives, you know, are there ethical, ethically sourced, eggs, you said eggs, 
Um, you know, are there, and there are, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are very like-minded with this group, you know, that are exploring different ways of um, bringing, and this is just talking about food, but there's so many other examples. So in a way, I know this might sound a little bit strange to say, but I celebrate your discomfort because it's going to lead to an exploration of are there alternatives? And unfortunately, we do have to get uncomfortable. Because part of the reason that we're in the situation that we're in is because of comfort, convenience, um, turning away. And so the invitation here is to be uncomfortable and see what arises. So well done. Thank you for sharing. Sure. I just wanted to add to that. Um, I had fish for lunch. And so the exercise was quite violent, I think. Um, like similar to what you said, all the systems and the peoples, you know, that carried the fish to me. And then even the fish itself were bred in captivity. Um, it was all like really uncomfortable. And so um, I think I felt like a, a sense of guilt and maybe responsibility. Mm -hmm. That was like a really interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And may I ask if it feels comfortable, what, what came up when, um, so you were feeling that kind of guilt, that un, unpleasant experience around it. What about where you're using the energy, how you're using the energy going forward? Yeah, I think, um, it, the energy spent after it felt really self-serving. Mm. So I, I just you know, finished work and then I went to yoga and now I'm here. And I, like my first thought was like, I'm hungry again. So I'm like going to eat again soon. It's just felt really selfish. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's something to consider of, um, you know, full disclosure, I am plant-based and I'm, I'm not, my intention here is not to make everyone vegetarian. <laughs> but I will say if, if there are going to be animals involved in how we're consuming energy, do that fish proud, you know, like take that energy. And for me, my, my personal reaction, when you go to practice yoga with the energy of that fish, that is a benevolent action. You're taking care of yourself and dot, 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 so you can take care of others, you know, so you can show up in the world in a way that you want to. So it's not necessarily about feeling bad about what you're eating. Uh, it's about how you're using the energy going forward. If you want to go to a place of, you know, looking at <laughs> the animal products, that's cool, but that's not what I'm, I'm pointing to here. It's more about the... Um, the next links in that chain. And I appreciate and kind of honor the, the feeling of it being self-serving and also the opportunity that comes with every time that we consume something that we can, we can do good with that energy, regardless of where it came from. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> yeah, I also connected with that feeling of like, there's a, horrible story behind, you know, the cheese on my pizza from the little pizza shop up there. On the one hand, I felt like I know the people there and I tip and they're working and it's cordial. But then, you know, sort of tracing back, I'm sure that cheese came in a big plastic thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it was produced in some kind of industrial thing. And I'm sure that there was some poor cow that was milked in this, you know, really machine-like sort of um, way that I find um, really like upsetting um and it's it was interesting because it felt like that in order to participate in this um system the way i do it feels like it requires me to not look further mm -hmm. like i remember having a conversation with a friend once saying that that the fact that this chicken is wrapped in cellophane makes me i don't have to think that it's the chicken it's like a piece of thing in the cellophane in the supermarket and so i don't have to sort of think back about it, but I, I do remember that there's certain, like I stopped eating veal because I thought, oh, those are baby cows. And then I don't want to eat duck because ducks are cute. <laughs> I don't want to eat lamb. And so there's this way in which I sort of like was, was cutting back on my, 
um, you know, things I think are cruel and, and difficult in that way based on a sort of, a, I don't know, just some kind of ethic that is more about that uh, somehow I think that ducks are more adorable than chickens. And so I'll eat a chicken, but I won't eat it. And it just feels like it's very, um, I don't know, it feels like it's very uh, inviting us to sort of look back in that way does open a lot of things and also calls to mind the fact that I really depended on not, you know, on limiting my vision mm -hmm. in order to participate in, in uh, a lot of the ways that are, uh, that the system enables, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. me to do things like that. So, um, yeah. I mean, I also felt a lot of like sense of the, the whole chain of people who were in doing that from you know feeding the cow to transporting the milk to processing it, I just had the sense of all of these people, and I feel tremendously grateful to them. And I have no, they're, but they're all faceless, nameless, and so as a result, I don't like. I sort of know them in a kind of a kitschy way, uh -huh. but they're sort of like they're workers, and you know, isn't that wonderful? But it's sort of like I don't have a sense of any of their, um, you know, is this the only option that's available? Are they like living in? Terrible conditions are they are they basically fine or you know it's, it's sort of like it felt like there's a a lot of blank spaces mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It sounds kind of familiar to what Tia was sharing. I'm like, I don't really know exactly the story of everyone that touched this ingredient on its way to me, but almost everyone has been talking about a sense of gratitude, and so when we feel feel grateful, we tend to want to do good things for other people. You know, part of our economy is exchange, whereas um, the gifting, a gifting economy is more about, it's called a bond of obligation. When we feel grateful because we receive something, we tend to want to do good things for other people. It's not necessarily like a, a even a transactional exchange between two individuals. Uh, and so when we take time to follow the path back of the food that we're eating and feel that gratitude, then see what happens next. And that's really why I keep pointing back to then what are the next links on that chain? So while there might be a mix of discomfort for various reasons, whether it's because of animals or because of um, systems of oppression or because of plastic packaging, that's one thing, but there's also the gratitude behind it that we even had the food to eat. And then what are we gonna do with that energy? You know, so it's almost like this ripple effect. A lot of the, um, when I reflect on ethics and what that means to me, it's like, what's the energy that I'm putting out into the world? What is this like ripple effect that's coming from me? And how can I use that to be of best benefit? Um, like, yes, to other people, but also myself, because when I'm taking care of, then I can show up better for other people. So, um yeah, really just keep keep thinking through and, and sorry, actually, I'm going to keep feeling through that process and what that was like. <clears throat> what are some of the things that that might be getting in the way? Because we're talking specifically now, we've had a couple of things come up around animals, around plastic, about working conditions, about the economy. What are some of the things that are getting in the way? What makes this so hard? Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is, I guess, I guess it's two, two things. One is like habits, habit energies, and, and which relates to the kind of disconnection that we've been talking about, like, oh, well, if I think about that, then I feel bad. So I'm not going to think about that. Right. Um, because I like eggs or whatever it is. Right. Um, and then the other thing is just the the system we live in, the, the the milieu we live in. You know, I just as an example, plastic bags. I try not to obtain new plastic bags, and yet I do it sometimes. Or plastic. You know, I try not to buy anything that is prepackaged in plastic. And yet I do sometimes because that's what, of it, what is available or because I look the other way because I want it. <laughs> so those are, those are two things that get in the way for me. 
Yeah. 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 I think continuing that line of thought, um, it's just, it's so easy and convenient to pick up the plastic bag full of rice or whatever, um, and to take advantage of all these, these, uh, conveniences, um, and not, there's no, there's no pressure really to think about where they come from. In fact, probably pressure from the other way because it's so disturbing to think about. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no, there's no barrier to just going and picking up a plastic bag full of chicken parts. It's very, very easy to do it. You don't have to think about it. There's no one saying, hey, think about where this chicken came from or where this plastic's going to end up. Yeah. Yeah, I was just remembering uh, when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in Israel, and at the time, it was sort of a, I think they use words like second world, whatever. It was a very low materialistic economy, very different. Now it's a lot more like the U.S., but we would go to the grocery store, and we wouldn't bring our own bags because they didn't give you bags. You had to bring your own bags, and everything was in bulk. There were no packaged items. So there was no, there was no option. There was no easy, like, oh, pick it up, buy it. So it really is this, that's where I say the resistance, it's that against the stream thing, right? If the, if the stream is flown by with all plastic bags, it's very easy to pick one up. That's a Ooh, weird metaphor, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do y'all think that this kind of the idea of interdependence or interbeing as a pillar, as a kind of one of the, the main platforms that secular ethics are based on, how can we bring that um, to life in our own ways, in our own world? I hear a lot around awareness, around turning towards what's discomfort and hearing things about like convenience and ease. But what are some other, and, and not just about like some, well, whatever's coming up for you, but I think thinking bigger, you know, like oppression and inequality and like, how does this concept of interdependence affect that? And how can we bring positive change to some of these destructive aspects of our culture and the way that we live? I, I have a question. When you're talking about inner being, is that related to what you're talking about? For example, when in thinking about all the the different the way that the energy moved from all the different into us and then out, is that are you, is that that's, it's all in the same? Yeah, there's two. There's two. I like to think. I almost. I I think in in visual. So I, I'm there's like the chain extending this way and then the chain extending to towards the future like what are we doing with it and then we're here right now having this conversation and feeling into it okay well so i, I have a question about that because i sort of had a little bit during the the visualization i had sort of had like a little bit of cynicism mm -hmm. there like because like I, I i love the example that tom gave about it's well it's just here now it's been packaged for me it's just this thing now right and so I was thinking, well, but is there like any of that energy there? Or is it just like this thing now? Is it just like, an, it, for me, it was the Parmesan cheese. <laughs> I had also had my whole guilt like situation happening there. <laughs> it was like, well, is it, is there really like cow energy here? Is there really like labor energy here? Or is this just like this powdered like substance? Well, if you took the cow energy out of it, what would be there? Well, no, no, I agree with you that 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 needed to happen in order for this to happen. But at this point, like, I guess what, what I'm what what exactly does that mean? Is it like an idea of that energy, or is it an actual thing? What do you think? I'm not sure. The energy that you're using to talk and move your hands right now, where is that coming from? Part the yeah. So there you go. And so then the words that we use, the way that we move our body in the world, the choices that we make going this way, the chain as the chain expands this way, we can influence positive change or benevolent action when we think about it. And this um, it's almost like this is just a stop. The energy that's in our body right now is just a pit stop 
before it moves on into some other form. And that one of the beautiful things that I think I, I feel a lot of gratitude is that in by, uh, being a human being gives me the opportunity to choose what I want to do with it. It's not just this, you know, a lot of animals, they don't have that choice. They're just um, innately going about their day, you know, according to their instincts, but we actually have the room for choice. How do we want to use the energy from that cheese? So we're getting kind of towards the end. I feel like maybe this should be two hour classes. <laughs> I really appreciate all the viewpoints um, that everyone has been sharing. Um, I did hear uh, a few times uh, as people were sharing, the word guilt came up. And so I just want to name this before we end. Guilt is, can actually be a very constructive response to something. Shame is where we start getting into some hot water, right? So shame is more, or guilt is like this bad thing happened or I did this destructive thing. Shame is I'm a bad person for it. And so just knowing that sometimes these uncomfortable feelings that are associated with guilt can actually be the thing that propels us into uh, a positive change or a constructive change. I wanted to end with a couple um, uh, reflections on, on how this interdependence concept um, can, can support multiple ethical systems. Um, so some of you may have heard of humanism. Um, so kind of the idea that uh, humans have inherent worth and dignity. Um, so um, interconnectedness is tied to the importance of human values, reason, and human rights. Um, that we're all interconnected in our shared humanity. So we'll talk a little bit about that next time. Environmental ethics. Uh, so interconnectedness is tied to the belief that all living beings are connected and interdependent, that humans have a moral obligation to protect the environment and preserve natural resources for future generations. And social contract theory. So uh, that the individuals enter into a social contract with one another in order to protect their rights and ensure their well-being. And that this contract is based on an understanding of interdependence and shared responsibility. So it, you know, our, a lot of our conversations were focusing kind of on that ingredient, but there were conversations also around the packaging, the work environment, and also what we do with that energy. So some invitations to keep this, keep the energy that you have consumed today going <laughs> and um, perhaps reflect on how this concept of interdependence um, can, how you can move that from a conceptual idea into more of an embodied one, a lived experience, that energy is in us. And we have the choice of how we want to ethically respond to the world around us. So thinking about how we can recognize and um, challenge these systems of oppression and inequality, how we have the responsibility to take care of the environment as stewards for the next generations, even for ourselves. Um, so keep this reflection going, even if, and especially if it feels uncomfortable, that's how you know you're on the right path, okay? Um, so we're at time. Um, let's just end with uh, a little uh, practice, perhaps closing the eyes or just softening the gaze. We'll just be here for a minute or two. And so just to call to mind the energy that we've been cultivating here together, listening to each other's reflections on interdependence, and ethics, the energy that we spend on that practice and reflection. And as we've been exploring, as we look back on that journey of the ingredient to our plate, and that's now in our body, just a moment of appreciation and gratitude for all of the beings and all the energy that they put into that ingredient that's inside us now. And then let's finish our time together by setting an intention quietly in your mind of how you would like to use that energy going forward. May that energy be of the greatest benefit to ourselves, all those around us, and our planet.
on the next exhale, letting go of this practice, letting go of our session. Thank you very much for joining me on this exploration of embodied ethics. Look forward to hopefully seeing you again. This will be every Tuesday um, for the next couple of weeks. Um, next week, we'll talk a little bit about common humanity, compassion. Um, I'll also be teaching a breathwork class here next Thursday. Um, it's a deep diaphragmatic breath practice to help calm the nervous system so we feel safe enough to access these ethics that are innately in us. And then this Saturday, I'll also be teaching a workshop format of the research study that I'm teaching for at Brown, uh, Mindfulness Queer, Mindfulness-Based Queer Resilience. So if you or anyone in your community uh, identify anywhere on the queer continuum of gender or sexual orientation, uh, please come Saturday, 1 to 4.30. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you online. Have a good night.